itself. So um, we are studying uh, first, second, and third John. We're still in first John right now. Um, so you're kind of getting thrown into the middle of that, but I'll, I'll hopefully uh, you'll see some benefit from the lesson this morning. I think uh, it will be some lessons that will uh, be helpful to you, whether you've been following along with us or not. Uh, but before we get into our lesson, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another beautiful day, the Lord's Day, where we have the opportunity to gather together. Uh, and especially this hour as we study your word, we pray that you will be with us and guide us as we do that. Help us to see the lessons and themes that you want us to see. Help us to apply them to our lives as we go forward. Father, as we've been discussing, help us to be righteous because you are righteous. Help us to love one another as uh, you have loved us and, and help us to always stand firm in the truth and our belief in you and your son and, and all that he said and did. Father, we pray that you be with those that are not able to be with us this morning, whether it's sickness or, or whatever the reason traveling. I would just pray that you'll keep them safe and watch over them so that they can be with us soon. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, if you want to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, uh, we are going to finish that up this morning and get into chapter 3 this morning. Uh, and it was, we've been talking about in 1 John chapter 2, uh, there are, I think, three kind of tests. Uh, what seems to be going on behind the scenes uh, in 1 John is that there's been some division in the church. Uh, there are people who we uh, refer to as Gnostics who uh, have tried to divide the church. Uh, they had different beliefs. But largely, they focused on the fact that there was this kind of special knowledge that some had and not others, uh, and there were a lot of implications in that, and so there were a lot of things that were taught by them that uh, moral character and righteousness was not necessarily required, which flies in the face of what John's talking about here uh, and what Jesus uh, taught. There were some that claimed to know God on a special level that others did not, and so John starts in chapter 2 by saying, you know, here are some ways you can know who truly knows God and who is falsely claiming to know God. And so we talked about three different kind of tests or, or ways we can look at someone's life and tell whether they truly know God, whether they're truly living as God would have them to live. And so we talked about this idea of righteousness uh, and love and, and true belief, true belief in who Jesus was, okay? And so we were kind of finishing up that uh, towards the tail end of First uh, John chapter 1, or chapter 2, in verse 21, John says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. So what's one way to know whether someone truly knows God? What do they say about Jesus? Who do they say Jesus is? Is Jesus the Son of God? And what we believe about Jesus is really the, the whole foundation of our faith. It's the whole foundation of Christianity. And I would suggest that the, the question, who is Jesus, is something that every person since Jesus lived has to answer, has to grapple with. There's, you may not realize this, there's really not a lot of debate over whether Jesus lived. Whether someone named Jesus lived in the first century in Palestine and was the leader of this uh, religious movement and was crucified. There's not really a debate whether that person lived. The debate is over who was he? Who truly was Jesus? Um, the question was not, did Jesus live, but who was he? And, and some have said, well, he's just this moral teacher. He said a lot of good things, but that's kind of the end of it. He's not uh, you know, really more than that. But that's really an impossible conclusion when we look at Jesus, because Jesus did not claim to be a moral teacher. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed, claimed to be God in the flesh. So we can't accept all of the good moral teachings, 
but then reject that because if Jesus said all of those things and they weren't true, what does that mean about Jesus? He's a liar. Okay, so we can't simply say that he's a a moral teacher. Uh, You guys know who C.S. Lewis is? Wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? You may may also know that he also uh, wrote a lot of uh, good novels and and things about uh, Christianity and a lot of things about faith. Um, And he's uh, famous for this this idea, this argument, uh, that there's really only three options as to who Jesus was. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Okay? Um, Here's what he said in in Mere Christianity. This was a series of lectures that he gave, and it was eventually put together in a book. And here's a passage from that. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that is Christ, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. There's a lot of people who say that. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. There's no other option. He's either the Lord, or he's a liar, or he was out of his mind. And so John is saying here uh, in this letter, you have to make that choice. The, the one who, cl- who confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that is who truly knows God. And that fits into our, our final test here. And so Christians have to hold to that truth. They cannot deny that truth. And whether it is in the, in the church or in the world, this, this idea that we kind of touched on last week, that there is a universal truth that we have from God, and that's exactly what Jesus claimed to be. He claimed to be the truth. We have to stand firm in that. If we don't stand firm in that belief in the church, then what happens? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, if we don't stand firm in the truth, then we, we can slide into to things that are not of the truth. If, if we don't stand for the truth in the world, then, then we're just going to get further and further into that system where there, there is no truth. There's no such thing as, as truth. All right, so um, let's move on here. We're going to circle back on these tests in chapter 3, as you'll see in just a minute. Um, in uh, verse 24, let's read verse 24. As for you, see that what you heard from the beginning remains in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing which you received from him remains in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you remain in him. Now little children remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not draw back from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness also has been born of him. So... Anybody notice a particular word that was repeated several times in that passage? Righteousness is, what else? The one that's repeated six times in what I just read. Okay. Not know. Remain. Remain is said six times in those few verses I just said, and it's said another seven times if I counted right in chapter three that we're gonna to get to in just a second. So the, the problem that, that John has identified is there's been division, there's some who have left, who have been drawn away by these false teachers. And so now John is addressing those who remain and encouraging them to remain, to remain faithful. He says, see that what you heard from the beginning remains in you. How are these people gonna remain faithful? Because this is not gonna stop. There's been false teaching throughout time. There's going to be con- continuing false teaching. So what, it, what are they going to do? How are they going to stick with this? 
How do we remain faithful? I think there's two things here that John points to. One is the Word of God. He says, see that what you heard from the beginning remains in you, in verse 24. Remember what you were first taught. Remember what me and the apostles first taught you when you first came to know Christ. Don't be drawn in by new teachings, by, you know, fancy ideas. Why are those things so attractive to us? New ideas, unusual ideas. Why do you think those draw so many people in? Yeah, because they're new. We're always attracted by something new, whether it's an idea, a product, whatever. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. um, If you're on social media, you know, uh, trends are one of the big things on like TikTok or or Instagram. There's trends and they're just, you know, I don't know if you can really define what a trend is, but you'll see the same kind of video repeated over and over again. It's a trend. It's the new thing and it lasts for two weeks and then it's the new one on to the next. We always are 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 attracted to new things. And so uh, what does John point them back to? Go back to what you were taught in the beginning, the basics. Uh, There's a saying that the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. So uh, if if one of the things we have is the word of God and, and John is telling us, let the word of God, what you had from the beginning remain in you, how do we let that remain in us? Stay true to it? Okay. And I think if we're going to stay true to the basics, we've got to know the basics, right? We, we need to know it if it's going to remain. It has to be in us before it can remain, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard for something to be in us if, if we don't take it in and read it in the first place, right? What else? Okay, that's it. There we go. All right, but, but of course we need to, to study it, to read it, to dwell on it, to meditate it. Uh, it needs to remain in us. The second I think that's mentioned here uh, is the Holy Spirit. And it's not specifically mentioned, but John refers in verse 27 to this anointing which you received from him, that it remains in you. John actually referenced this anointing back in verse 20. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Okay, so I think he's referring to the Holy Spirit here as something that's going to help them remain uh, faithful. We know that when we're baptized into Christ, uh, we receive salvation, the remission of sins, and what else? In Acts 2.38, what else do we receive? The gift of this Holy Spirit, absolutely. So um, there's not this special spiritual knowledge that some have as the Gnostics were teaching. All Christians who've been baptized have the Holy Spirit. All Christians uh, have this gift. But John says that these things need to remain in us, but we also need to remain in God. We need to remain in him. Verse 28, now little children remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not draw back. So what, what is John pointing to in verse 28 when he says, uh, now little children remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not draw back. What, what is he pointing to? Second coming. He's pointing to the end. Remain until then. Why? So that we may have confidence and not draw back in shame. We have to remain faithful, remain in him as we await Jesus' return. So as I was thinking about this, it made me think about um, husbands. Have you ever uh, been home alone for a weekend or a week while the wife was away? And um, maybe... You kind of lived a little bit of a different life, kind of relived your glory days of bachelorhood. You uh, maybe cook steak. That's what I like to do. I like to grill steaks and things like that. I don't clean the dishes right after I eat. I kind of let it get to them. I guess I shouldn't be saying all this. Um, but, you know, when, it's, when it gets toward the end of that weekend or whatever, I start to realize, 
I got to get ready. So she's coming home, and if this house is in this state, I'm going to be in big trouble. And, and sometimes I've failed, and I've not gotten it gotten ready. Um, and so that's not never good. But you know that feeling, that sense of uh, that important person in your life's coming, and you need to be ready and have the house in order or whatever it may be. Um, we need to be ready and not wait till the last minute. We need to be ready constantly because I know my wife's coming home Sunday night, but I don't know when, when God is coming. We, we come up with a lot of ideas about the second coming, but one thing I know for sure is we don't know when it is. So I better be ready. I better have my house in order, my life uh, right with God um, so that I'm ready when he comes. Because it's really not just a matter of being ashamed, as John's pointing out here. It's, it's much more than that. It's a matter of, of life and death, spiritual life and death. If we lose faith, if we're not ready, if we don't remain in him, then we face judgment. So life has a lot of challenges, all right? The Christians here are going to face a lot of challenges. They're going to face more persecution, more false teaching. They've got to remain faithful. We've got to remain faithful, too. With all those challenges, what, what do you think is the key to do that, doing that? That's a good point. I, I've tried to emphasize with the teens I'm teaching all the time, uh, the idea of having an eternal perspective. Um, you know, it's easy when you're a young person, when you're a teenager, it's easy to just be focused on, or, or at any age, I think, if you're a, a human being, it's easy to just kind of be focused on what's right in front of you, the next problem, the next task at work. It's, it's hard to be focused on what's above when you have so much going on in front of you, but I think we have to. I think we have to be Focused eternally uh, on God. What else? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. All right. That's a great point. And, and both of you have touched on the two big things John's emphasizing here in these chapters. Um, one, he's focusing us on Jesus, and then two, he's focusing us on each other. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot more about our love for each other, our love for God, things like that. Anything else? Okay. Right. And I, I think that's why he kind of started that section we read about pointing us back to the beginning, pointing us back to what Jesus said, said uh, being faithful to it, having trust in that. Anything else there? Yep, absolutely. I think it, I think prayer has to be at the center of all these things. Absolutely. Um, so in the midst of all this, verse 25, John reminds us, and I think this is what somebody mentioned earlier, kind of focusing on, on, on God. He reminds us of the end. He points us to the end. He reminds us of the wo- reward that awaits us at the end. This is the promise which he himself made to us eternal life there in verse 25. So remember that that's one of John's primary purposes in writing here to, to assure us as Christians of our eternal life, of our salvation. Um, and so we shouldn't be distracted by false teaching. We need to focus on uh, the word, on Jesus, and not be led astray uh, by these people who are trying to distract us with different things. All right, so uh, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteous righteousness also has been born of him. Um, and so this is here our second. We talked a couple weeks ago about how there's a few big kind of simple yet powerful statements uh, that John makes here about who God is. Remember we said it, a lot of people struggle with how to define God. Who is he? John says very simply, 
a, a few statements that describe him. Anybody remember the first one? Back in chapter 1? God is what? what? Love is coming up. Chapter 1 is, is God is light. Remember, God is light. Uh, so love will be the next one. Here he says, is, John says, he is righteous. Why are Christians to be righteous, as John is talking about? Because God is righteous. And I think this is an aspect that uh, a lot of people struggle with. A lot of people um, find difficult to think about. We often think of God, I think, in two different boxes. We kind of think as the, the God of the Old Testament being the, the God of righteousness and wrath and judgment. And then the God of the New Testament is different. He's all about love and grace. Um, I think those two go hand in hand. I don't think there's two different boxes. Um, we always see the wrath of God hand in hand with the love of God, the righteousness with the love of God and the grace of God. Um, but we certainly do see the righteousness and wrath of God in the Old Testament. You go back to the very beginning, God puts Adam and Eve in the garden and he gives them responsibilities. He gives them rules, things that they're to do and to not to do. And what happens when they break that one big rule? They're punished because God is righteous. And we see that throughout the Old Testament, God punishing wickedness, rewarding righteousness, okay, because he is righteous. But we also see that in the New Testament. And make no mistake, Jesus emphasizes righteousness. We talked, I think, last week about what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 about those who will do lots of good things, but when we look at their life, they were not practicing righteousness. They were unlawful. And so what does Jesus say about those kind of people? I never knew you. Depart from me. Okay? So Jesus absolutely condemns unrighteousness, and he would reject this idea that the Gnostics that John's addressing uh, had that, you know, it's, it's okay to live as you want as long as you have this kind of spiritual enlightenment. Um, he would reject that notion and he would want us to live uh, as God wants us to live. And so because God is righteous, John is telling us we need to practice righteousness. All right, so that brings us to chapter three. And we're going to see that, that John is going to kind of go back to these three tests. He's going to expand on them as we go through. But first, in, in verses one through three, um, he makes kind of, I think, an observation about the love of God. Uh, and so let's pick up in chapter three, verse one. See how great... A love the Father has given us, that we would be called children of God, and in fact we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope set on Him purifies himself just as He is pure." Um, so John is going back to this idea of love and he's going to continue to talk about love throughout the rest of the, the book. It's one of the central themes of this letter. Um, here we, we've talked about our love that we're supposed to have for each other as Christians. Here he's talking about God's uh, love for us. And, and how great is God's love for us? That he has called us his children. We are his children. What, what a thought. The creator of the universe, all-powerful, almighty, he is our father. We are his children. That, that phrase, how great, that's used there, literally in the Greek means from what country. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a phrase that is supposed to express astonishment, amazement. It, this is an unbelievable thought that God would call us his children and that he would be our father. It's, it's out of this world to think of that. And I think we say that all the time. We acknowledge that, that we're, we're children of God and things like that. But I, I don't know how often, at least me, I don't know how often I've just really sat and reflected on how amazing that thought is. How powerful it is that God is not just a, a distant, supreme being. He is our Father. And I understand that that's a, a, a conflicting idea, a challenging idea for a lot of people because... People relate that to what? Their earthly father. And so for some of you, that's a, a comforting thing to compare God to your earthly father. But I know for some of you, that may be a very difficult idea. 
Because a lot of people, unfortunately, do not have a good relationship with their father, or they may not have even known their father. But when we look at God and think of him as a father, our Heavenly Father is not a deadbeat. He's not absent. In fact, when we read through Scripture, we see a father who is going through tremendous great lengths to love and care for his children. He's going through great lengths to provide for and to have a relationship with his children. And really it's us, his children, who are kind of at times the deadbeat, the absentee. Okay? We, we see throughout time that, that the Israelites, uh, despite all that God does for them, reject him. And, and we also reject him when we sin. But God is always loving and trying to reach down and have a relationship with us. He's the kind of father that any child would want to have. And we are supremely blessed to have him as a father. What else is implied with this idea of fatherhood? Well, we're made in his image, all right? You know, I, I can't help but look at my son and think about the fact that he is made in my image. I mean, you know, for most of his life, he's looked almost exactly like me. He's starting to look a little more like his mom, I think. Um, but, but in the same way, we're made in God's image. That's what we're told right in the very beginning, Genesis 1, 26. They say, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness. And John says there in verse uh, 2 that we're going to be even more like him. We're going to become, um, we're, we're, we don't know yet what we'll exactly be like, but we will be like him, he says in verse 2. It's interesting here, um, does John know exactly what that's going to look like? No, he, even John. I mean, th think about that. All the, all the insight, the direct contact with Jesus had, the, the revelation that John had to him. Even John does not have all the answers to what the end is going to be for us, to what it's going to look like. And so uh, just something to think about. We don't have to have all the answers. I think a lot of people want to have all the answers. I want to have more answers. We should be content uh, to not have all of the answers. Um, but in the meantime, John says, what do we do as we wait? We need to purify ourselves. All right? This implies an act of, of ceremonially cleansing, purifying ourselves. It makes us, makes us think of this idea of holiness. God is holy. God is pure. Therefore, we as Christians need to be pure and holy. All right. So, that brings us into what I think is, is kind of a, a rehash, um, a, a repetition of those three tests from chapter two, the, this moral or, or test for righteousness, this test uh, for love, and this uh, test for a true belief. And John's going to repeat those ideas, I think, for, on, on purpose because he really wants to drive those points home. But he's also going to uh, expand on this. And so uh, in verse four, he says, every one who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Uh, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who remains in him sins continually. No one who sins continually has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil." For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who has been born of God practices sin because his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin continually because he has been born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother and sister." So uh, John says everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. This is not a new idea John's bringing up. He's talked about sin, the fact uh, that we should not sin as Christians. Uh, what does he say Jesus' purpose in coming was? To take away sin. And so if Jesus' purpose in coming was to take away sin, how can Christians, his followers, continue in sin? And there's a lot of passages we can turn to that talk about that idea. We're not going to for the sake of time, but when we sin, we're rejecting that sacrifice. We're rejecting the entire purpose of Jesus coming, which was to take away sins. Um, notice uh, the connection to the end of chapter two. Uh, he says in verse six, uh, no one who 
um, remains in him sins continually. Verse 9, um, no one who has been born of God practices sin because a seed remains in him. You see that, that phrase remain coming up again. Um, the children of God and the children of devil are obvious here. What's one what? Yes, sir. And that's a great point. That's what John, you know, in chapter one points, makes the point that all sin, including Christians, you're exactly right. Um, but what is our, our, our purpose? Are we practicing sin or are we practicing righteousness? Good point. Um, so how do we identify the child of God as opposed to um, the child of the devil? What does John say? What, what, what's your practice? Is it sin or righteousness? And John says it's obvious. Again, we're trying to identify, you know, we've got people claiming to have this special uh, enlightenment or spiritual, but what do we see in their life? They're practicing evil. So that tells us, John says, that they are not children of God, they're children of the devil, right? It, it's not enough to just be, oh, I'm a child of God, that's great. That's, that's now a, a free pass. You know, we, we think of people that, you know, are, are the child of someone really important, a politician or a really wealthy person. Sometimes they get away with a lot, right? That's not, that's not the case with God. When you're a child of God, that comes with a lot of expectations. You need to live different. Okay? You have to practice righteousness because God is, is righteous. Um, so do you want to be a child of God or do you want to be a child of the devil? God. The easy question, I think, for us to answer, at least intellectually. But the, the problem becomes putting it in, into practice. It's an easy question to answer, but much harder uh, to live out. But that's what God calls on us to do. Um, so we're moving a little quicker here. Um, the next test we said was this idea of a love test. And again, John comes back to it in verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we are to love one another. Not as Cain, who was the evil one and murdered his brother, and for what reason did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life, eternal life remaining in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will set our heart at ease before him. That if our heart condemns us, that God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So how else are the children of God identified and distinguished from the children of the devil? Not only righteousness, but how they love one another. So what's the example uh, John gives here? Going way, way back. Cain and Abel, right? You remember the story of Cain and Abel? Uh, they're both bringing sacrifices to God, um, and, and Cain's is not accepted. Abel's is accepted. Uh, Cain, in his anger, strikes Abel down and kills him. We're told that what was Abel doing? Sir. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you love one another, 
Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and so, so Cain. What, what, do we, what does John tell us that Abel was doing? What, what were the difference in the deeds of Cain and Abel? One was righteous and the other was not. So, kind of the same distinction here: righteousness, obedience. And, and evil and disobedience. All right. Um, going back to you, kind of brought this up. So, if you go back to what we talked about last week, what what did we say? The the two greatest commands that are in the Old Testament, and then Jesus emphasizes again in his life: love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And Jesus tells us. We read this, and you brought it up. If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. How do we love God? We keep his commandments. So you brought that up. Good point. Um, righteousness and love for our brother really go hand in hand. Okay. Um, Cain's unrighteousness led him to kill and hate his brother. All right. So we see how they go hand in hand. Um, we think this command may be easy to understand, right? Okay. So what's the implication here? Okay. Don't murder my brother. Easy. I think for most of us, all right, wasn't for Cain. Um, but I, I think it goes deeper than that. John goes deeper than that. What does he say in verse 15? Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. Does that remind you of, of any you know, statement or series of statements by Jesus? Sermon on the Mount, exactly. All right. Yep, yeah. Go over to Matthew chapter 5. And you see, um, again, so much of what John's saying really parallels the teachings of Jesus. He's really not pointing himself to his own ideas. He's pointing us to the words uh, of Jesus. Um, look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not murder, and whoever commits murder shall be answerable, answerable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court. To the court. Then he goes on to make the same point about adultery. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but if you have lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery. All right, so, so we can't sit here and say, well, well, I haven't murdered my brother, so I'm good. I'm doing a good job with this, John. Um, let's move on. What about what's in your heart? Do you have hatred or do you have a lack of love in your heart uh, for your brother? You want to have, if you want to not remain in Christ and remain faithful, then don't have love for your brother. Hate your brother. That's one way we can not remain in Christ and remain in fellowship with Christ. And so, um, again, we have a couple of reasons, where, a couple of passages or verses here back in 1 John chapter 3 where um, John is tying the, the love uh, for the brothers to what our relationship with what the world all right verse uh go back to verse three what did what did uh, we say about his children um or i'm sorry verse one of chapter three for this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him all right and then verse 13 do not be surprised brothers and sisters if the world hates you so as children of God who are practicing righteousness, who are practicing love, why would that cause the world to hate us or to not know us? Jealousy, okay. So people might look at what, you know, the love we have or should have and be kind of envious of it because, because why? Why would they be jealous? Yeah, the world's not very, very loving by and large, right? Was that a hand? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Abel's righteousness caused him to have a different relationship with God than Cain had with God, and he was jealous of that. So the world would look at us and see our relationship with each other and be jealous of that and have a, a similar hatred. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It's when you get into the 
faded each other that much. But if you Well, and I think they should. And I think if we live as Christ wants to live, we should be very good citizens. We should be very good employees. We should be very good friends. But I mean, John tells us in verse 13 here, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. So for whatever reason, despite even when we live as we should, sometimes people are going to hate us because of who we are. And I, I think that's because if, if I'm a Christian, if I'm standing in, in the truth, standing for righteousness, what does that say about the world? That they're wrong. That they're condemned. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, people tend to naturally feel judged if someone's doing the right thing and they recognize I'm doing the wrong thing. We, we kind of feel judged by that naturally. Yes, sir. Right. right, and that, that's what John says right at the start there. The, for this reason, the world does not know us, and therefore they tend to hate us. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's something that you know, people tend to kind of throw in your face. And, you know, I think you might say that, you know, John 316 is the, the most quoted or most famous passage. But I think it's maybe judge not lest you be judged. Right. Um, and it's sometimes used because someone is being improperly judgmental. But a lot of times it's just using because someone's trying to do the right thing or they're speaking up for the right thing. And uh, yeah, people tend to think because you're living right. Oh well, you're just you're better than me. You're holier than that. All that. Yes, sir. Yeah. And that's, I think the division that's happening here is among religious people. It's not like Roman officials that are the problem here. It's, it's people from within and, and religiously minded people that are causing division and that they're having problems with it. I think, I think there's certainly something to that. Um, we're out of time. We're going to pick up on these uh, ideas. What does love look like? What does it mean to love your brother? Because John's going to get more practical here and give us some, some good uh, things to think about and how we can love our brother. So we'll finish up chapter three next week and get into chapter four. Appreciate all your comments and attention.